Welcome to the Artist Advisory Hotline, the podcast for artists who want valuable guidance and honest answers on how to grow their careers and develop their new project from leading art world experts and artists. Here's your host and founder of the Artist Advisory, Marina Press Granger. Tune in as she gets you the answers you deserve. Hello, artists. I'm your host, Marina Granger. And today on the hotline, we have an incredible guest. It is artist Catherine Mason. And what's so special about her work is that she paints with lipstick. That's right. She paints with actual lipstick. And not only that, but her work really supports the fight against breast cancer. You will hear it from her on the podcast, exactly how she comes up with this, how she does this. Uh, But one really special thing is that a portion of her proceeds goes to the National Breast Cancer Foundation. Now, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I am sure that we have plenty of lady listeners who should be doing something called feeling it on the first. So the idea is that you give yourself a self exam on the first of the month. And Catherine tells us a little bit about that. But most importantly, she is so inspiring because she really thought outside the box. She was like, okay, well, I'm really passionate about this. How can I use my medium to support my passion and really make a statement with her work? And so she did just that. And we are going to hear about how she did this in this episode. I'm so grateful to know Catherine, to have worked with her. She is truly incredible and a beautiful soul. Now, before we dive into the interview, I just want to update you on a couple of things that have been happening at the artist advisory. So I have done the most amazing thing I've ever done in this business. And that is created a masterclass that you can watch at any time. And you can interact with me inside this masterclass. I will get back to you if you have any questions. But something that has been really interesting for me is I have had so many artists approach me who are in a variety of different time zones. And I know that I can help them because I've worked with artists from all over the world. And I wanted to be there for them, right? So they can get my advice at any time. And so what I've done is I have created a masterclass that you can go ahead and watch at any time from wherever you are. You can chat in this masterclass. You can drop me a question. I will get back to you. And this masterclass teaches you how you can present your work and get it in front of the right people. Now, this is super special because this is something that any artist of any level will find useful. Here's the thing. I started this company back in 2018 after I realized how incredibly powerful you all are because of the internet, right? So I'm sure you have heard me talk about this, but I worked in galleries here in New York City for a long time. I was a gallery director for many years, and I saw so many artists that would come to me and ask me like, hey, how do I show here, or how do I get a gallery, or what do you think of my work? And to be honest, I just thought this is so unreal that Nobody is teaching artists how to get their work out there. These are people who went to art school. There are people who didn't go to art school. These are people who have been showing in one way or the other for decades in some cases, yet still everything was so nebulous. So in my masterclass, I teach you how the landscape of the art world has shifted so much So that what you can do is you can take the way you present your artwork and get the right people interested in it 
and approach them softly. So it doesn't feel like you are soliciting them, but it feels like a truly genuine connection. And I teach you all of that inside this class. If you're interested, all you have to do is either go to my website, which is theartistadvisory.com and click watch the free masterclass, or you can hit the link in the show notes. But this is so cool because I posted about it just recently on Instagram and over a hundred people have taken this class already, which is so cool. Um, and what is even cooler is that there are people from all over the world watching this class at whatever time. And this has inspired me so much because what I did was, I'm sure you guys have heard of my course, the Artist Academy, that I've taught many, many times already to hundreds of artists, and it's been amazing, but it always had this live component, which was a live Q&A. But here's what I'm doing now. I have completely revised this course, made it totally self-paced so that artists from anywhere in the world could go through it at their own pace, on their own time, and benefit from the course. And so this is so cool to me because there are artists enrolled in this course already, and they get to do this on a time schedule that works for them. And there's nothing more that I want to underline than your time autonomy as an artist, right? Like we are not sitting here aiming to be in nine to five jobs <laughs> as artists. We, you know, when inspiration strikes you, it strikes you. And I really want to honor that. So that is why this course is now fully self-paced and if you watch the masterclass, there is a chance for you to enroll this in this course and work with me one-to-one -one as well. So I really urge you to do it. Now, I'm so excited. I've spoken about my retreat, my two-day workshop, uh, which will feel like a retreat because that's how I roll in Miami during Art Week this December. I'm so excited to say that the uh, retreat sold out. So I opened up another two days and it is half full at this point. Uh, and as I'm speaking, I literally, <laughs> this is so funny. I can't, I'm not uh, joking. Literally, it's now more than half full. Someone just bought a spot and I'm so, so delighted to uh, have you join us Anna, <laughs> I'm so excited. Yay. Um, and it's going to be so, so fun. So if you're interested in learning more about that, while there's still a spot left, um, you can again, go to my website, which is the artistadvisory.com. And there is also this really cool thing that I'm offering, which is a bundle uh, between the artist academy and this retreat so it's called the art world bundle and if you're interested you get a deal and you can do the artist academy at your own pace but you know get a lot of it done before we go to miami in december and then we get to hang out for two days you get to meet some experts have lunch with some curators or a gallerist you know um we're gonna have intimate lunches. So we're going to have one expert at each of these lunches. And it'll be so cool for you to practice what you have used inside or what you have learned inside the Artist Academy. So I wanted to just let you know about that. And I'm so, so excited that this is all happening. So I'm so grateful for all of you. So grateful. And I gotta say, I'm going to celebrate this even more because I am celebrating five years in business this fall. So I have something so, so cool for you coming up to celebrate my five years in business. And I want you to stay tuned because I will let you know what that is in our next episode. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce to you Catherine Mason. Hi. 
Hello, Catherine. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming. Of course. I'm happy to be here. It reminds me of old times. I know. We would meet up all the time on Zoom. And it was like so cool to meet you in person for the first time in Miami last year. It was so wild because we'd been seeing each other on Zoom, but never in real life. And I was like, I know you. Oh my gosh. Miami was so much fun. I want to go back so bad this year. I've just been so busy, but we almost saw Rihanna. It was so great. Yes. Well, she was on the same, she was like at the same rooftop as us. And there were like 10 people there. Nobody was there except for us and I guess like Rihanna's crew and some guys. Oh yeah. <laughs> I love that. Rihanna that was so yeah. wild. Rihanna rolls deep. That is a fact. We were trying to like <laughs> peek through the curtains, but yeah, it was absolutely impossible to find her in there, but we could tell she was there. <laughs> yeah, because people were telling us she was yeah. there. So, oh, well, hello, Rihanna, if you're listening, um, we go back. <laughs> no, <okay. laughs> anyway, so Catherine, I am so excited to have you on in October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I know that breast cancer has a lot to do with your work. So yes. would you tell us a little bit about what you do and also why you do it? Sure. So I am a full-time lipstick painter. Um, I work here in Houston, Texas, and I paint with donated lipstick. So the way that breast cancer kind of ties into my work is um, the reason I started painting with lipstick was because we had a really good family friend who was diagnosed with breast cancer back in 2013. Um, I'd say end of 2013, almost early 2014. And she really struggled with the symptoms of chemo and radiation. And one of the things that she had mentioned to me was a lot of the physical side effects that you go through have such a, um, you know, have such, she has such a hard time with it mentally. And she said that she didn't feel beautiful. She didn't feel like a woman. Obviously your hair falls out. That's kind of one of the most um, well-known symptoms, but there are a lot of other physical side effects. And so her whole thing was she was putting lipstick on before all of her chemo and radiation treatments. And that was her way of kind of taking control of her situation. And um, it was the one thing that she said made her feel beautiful again, made her feel like a woman and made her feel confident, you know, during that really difficult time. So I thought as an artist, you know, I was like, that's really interesting that something as small as a tube of lipstick could make such a big difference for her. And so conceptually, I took that and I thought, you know, what if I build an entire series of work created completely out of lipstick and I do it to raise money for the breast cancer community? Um, so I started back in 2014. At first, I started with my own lipsticks and then I quickly moved to my mom's lipstick um, and then from there, my, you know, friends and family members just started donating their lipstick to me while I was kind of playing around and seeing what I could do with it. And that's what kind of started my donation process. So now all of the paintings that I paint are created a hundred percent out of donated lipstick. I have people donate from all over the U S um, people will donate in honor and even sometimes in memory of family members and friends who've been through breast cancer. Um, and I've often received packages from women who've been through cancer, uh, not necessarily breast cancer, but they've been through um, some form of cancer. And it's been it's been such a great series to work on. It's been incredibly fulfilling work. Um, I've been able to donate 20% of my proceeds back to the National Breast Cancer Foundation. And I've just met so many amazing women along the way. Um, so yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a weird medium to work with, but it's been a lot of fun. That is so cool. And what is, can you tell us a little bit about this family friend? Where is she now? Yeah, so she is doing well now. Um, you know, it's funny because I've I've met a lot of people who've gone through cancer through starting this process um, and working on this series. And it's interesting because I found that a lot of women, they want to talk about their breast cancer journey and they want to advocate for breast health and you know, they spend a lot of time educating other women, telling their story. And then I've also found that there are a lot of women who, when they think back on their 
their cancer journey, it's very hard for them. Um, a lot of women don't like to talk about it. They like to kind of push it out of their mind. Um, and so she is one of those women. It's been really hard for her um, to talk about it. So one of the things that she asks, I mean, she loves the work. Um, she loves what I've done with it, um, you know, in honor of her story. But I tried, you know, not to mention her name for her privacy. Um, but it's interesting because I, I have learned that everybody has a different a different experience and a different, um, different memories associated with their cancer journey. Uh, but I, I am happy to say that she's doing very well. Um, she's been in remission for a couple of years now. And um, it's, it's interesting. I, I think sometimes cancer can, as hard as it is to go through for some people, it, they can end up better on the other side. Um, and I think that her cancer journey taught her a lot about health and wellness and nutrition. And um, not that she wasn't healthy before, but I almost feel like after her her cancer journey, she's she's do, she's doing so well and she's very healthy. So um, we're also happy for her and her family. Yeah, that is so cool to hear, and it's so good to know that she's doing okay. And also how like incredible is it for you to share the story with us so we understand I mean I'm sure we're all you know kind of uh, aware of this in some way or the other but it's so important to know that like you have to be gentle with some people who or with people when they're cancer survivors you know some people don't want to speak about it so much because it's not a great a memory, yeah. right? Yeah. Or whatever it is, it's a personal choice. So respecting that is so, so valuable. And, you know, while we're on this topic, I do want to ask you one more thing about her. How <laughs> old was she when she was diagnosed? Oh, gosh. Um, this is completely a guess because I'm not 100% sure. I know at the time she was around my mom's age. Um, to my mom she's I would say she was probably around her 50s maybe mm -hmm. she was more middle-aged for sure yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah that is cool although I think that age is awesome and the more we have it the better it is <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? absolutely so, every every year is a gift for sure absolutely and you did mention that you know your friend learned so much about health and nutrition of course this is a, an art podcast but <laughs> it's so important because a lot of people listening are women and so they're susceptible to something like this and everyone uh that we we hear about so many people getting sick right mm -hmm. And one of the biggest carcinogens in our environment are microplastics and chlorine. So the, they're really tiny things that I've done in my um, household to lessen the impact of these things. So one thing I did was I got a shower head filter for the chlorine. Oh, good. Yeah. So for anyone listening, you can get one on like Amazon or wherever you want to get a shower head filter. They're not very expensive and they're easy to install and they filter out some of these really harsh chemicals that are in our water. Right. And the other thing is just reducing the amount of plastic that we're storing our food in. So instead Absolutely. of having yeah, like instead of storing your food and plastic containers, get glass containers. Yeah. Right? A hundred percent. I I agree with you. I've always had an issue, especially like a lot of people heat up their food in plastic Tupperware. And it makes me want to gouge my eyes out because I'm like, oh my gosh, you are just cooking that plastic into your food and you might not realize it, but there are tiny, tiny particles of that plastic that are breaking off when you heat up your food in that Tupperware. Um, another one that's really big is don't ever drink hot drinks out of styrofoam cups or paper cups. Paper cups are lined with some sort of a plastic film and that hot liquid breaks that plastic down and you're ingesting it. Um, so a hundred percent agree with you. Stick to glass whenever you can, or, you know, even ceramic plates, um, because it's, you know, there's a lot of toxins and, and chemicals and issues with our food as well. And you can only make 
the, you know, the healthiest, smartest choices at the grocery store and things like that, but definitely don't miss the, what you're storing your food in, what you're eating your food off of, um, you know, drinking plastic water bottles. I know a lot of people say like, oh, you know, don't drink that water bottle that's in plastic if it's been sitting in your car, cause it's been, you know, heating up in your car. But people forget that all of the plastic water bottles that came to the grocery store were once on a very hot truck, roasting in the sun on the way to the grocery store, you know, so it's just being mindful of that. And if you have the ability to spend an extra dollar and get a, a water bottle that's glass, you know, those boss bottles instead of a plastic water bottle, definitely do so. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree with you. There's things we can do to help for sure. Absolutely. And it's so important because that one little thing can really help. Um, one thing about microplastics that is relevant to breast cancer is plastic has a really interesting, um, it, it's so similar, like the chemical composition of plastic is similar to estrogen. So it bonds with estrogen faster. Really? And so it's like a whole thing. I've been on this really interesting journey myself, <laughs> um, kind of learning a lot about uh, medical stuff is all I can say, um, because, you know, I'm a Reiki healer and a master. And so I've been really looking into healing medical issues. So, mm -hmm. and it's not something that I really want to do professionally, but it's something that I'm really interested in. So while I've been learning these things, I've been learning about all of this. So that's, well, that's awesome. I mean, education yeah. is so powerful and, you know, there's so many things that we can do and all it just takes is a little bit of awareness on the routines that you have, you know, how you go through your day. Um, and realistically it's, it's for your own benefit. So you might as well take the initiative to do it. Yeah, that is so cool. But, you know, back to your work, you're literally saving lives with art, right? How many times do we always hear like, oh, you want to be an artist? It's a really cool hobby. Like, what are you really doing here? Like, you should go be a doctor. Well, Catherine, you are showing mom because you are saving lives with your work. And can you tell us a little bit about how you're doing that? Yeah, sure. And and <laughs> I don't know about saving lives, but hopefully I'm at least improving some lives. Um, I feel like I'm doing a very small part and I'm a part of a, a wonderful community in a very different way. Um, a lot of my work, actually all of my work, ties back um, through themes and through imagery to breast cancer or cancer in general. Um, so I have a lot of images of the female body and trying to show women that there are so many beautiful and feminine parts about the female body that are not the breasts. Um, I know a lot of women who go through double mastectomies, it's very hard for them to feel beautiful and to feel like a woman and to have that feminine energy back. And through my body collection, I was really trying to show these women that like, Hey, you know, your, your wrist and your neck and your shoulder and your knees, like there are so many beautiful parts of your body, um, that hold a lot of power and are very feminine and beautiful. Um, so I, it's interesting considering all my work is for breast cancer. None of my paintings actually show breasts. Um, another thing I do is I work through floral imagery as well. So lots of roses, I found that roses are very, um, symbolic of a woman, you know, they're beautiful and they're delicate and they have all these layers to them, but there's also this, you know, thorny stem that's very strong and powerful and, um, can stand up for itself. And, uh, and then, you know, obviously we go into the symbolic collection and I have some paintings that, um, more so symbolize different things, uh, through the breast cancer journey. So for example, my painting toe to toe, um, it is my pride and joy. I want to keep it so bad, but I can't. <laughs> Um, but that painting is a, a beautiful painting of these old leather boxing gloves and the boxing gloves obviously represent the fight against cancer and the battle that these people go through for their lives. And I painted it in a way where it looks like it's hung up on a wall. And I really wanted the viewer to be able to decide whether or not 
it was hung up because the battle was won or it was hung up because the battle was lost because so many people have different experiences with cancer and with breast cancer. And I wanted to be able to honor everybody in a single painting. Um, that's also what I'm trying to do with this shoe painting that I'm working on right now. Um, so it is a variety of, of subject matter. And, um, but I would say as a whole, Oh, the series is really just to encourage women and uplift women and remind them of their beauty and their power and their resilience. And then, yeah, 20% of my proceeds go back to the National Breast Cancer Foundation. So that's a way for me to, you know, financially be able to support this community as well as emotionally. Yeah, and you had such an exciting uh, event in your studio. You are in Houston, Texas, and you're mm -hmm. located in the Silver Street Studios. You had such an exciting event. It looked so cool on the internet. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about it. You had it earlier this month of October 2023. Yep. So, yeah, I partnered with a, a diamond store here in Houston called Shaftel Diamonds, and I had always wanted to do a diamond painting all out of lipstick um, to add to my symbolic collection. So for me, you know, when you think of how a diamond is formed, it's formed under intense circumstances. There, there's this immense amount of heat and pressure um, and, you know, circumstances that don't really allow for life. Um, and it's because of a deformation within the diamond itself, what is what makes it shine pink. Um, it's I, I'm not exactly sure on the term, but there is a deformation within the stone that gives it the pink appearance. So I thought, you know, how interesting that this deformation, you know, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking cancer um, can create this, you know, this pink stone. And for me, it, it was symbolic of, you know, there's a lot of people that are going through very hard circumstances and are going through very something very tough in life. And if you can withstand those circumstances, and if you don't allow those circumstances to break you, you can become this beautiful, radiant thing on the other side. And so for me, the image of a pink diamond is a, it's an image of hope and of beauty um, and uh, an image of, you know, positive things to come really. So um, I partnered with him and I said, hey, listen, I want to host an event together in October for National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I want to do this pink diamond painting. Bring your jewelry. Like, let's just throw a big party. It'll be a fundraiser for the National Breast Cancer Foundation. And we'll, you know, reveal the painting at the event. And so we did just that. It was a private event. So we um, invited all of our top or at least for me, my top collectors, um, you know, some friends and family as well. And then he invited all of his top buyers from the diamond store. And we just had a fun party. And I got to actually do a live reveal of my painting, which I've never done before. <laughs> I was, it was so fun. But I like refuse to be the one to actually pull the fabric off of it because I'm so shy. So I was like, no, you guys can do that. I'm going to go hide in the back. Like, I don't want to actually pull it. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the diamond, yes. you do not like the pressure. No. No. I was like, y'all can do it. Like, I, it feels weird me being up there. So I went and hid behind this table, and, but everyone loved it. So we had a great time. Um, we were able to raise $5,200 for NBCF. And then I was also able to um, do a check donation from one of my latest commissions um, to them as well. So it was, it was awesome. We had such a fun time. That is so, so cool. I have so many more questions for you, but <laughs> tell me um, just briefly, how long has it been since you decided to start painting with lipstick and doing this work? Yeah. So my very first lipstick painting was actually in 2014. Um, I wanted to see if I could work with lipstick. And so it was a lot of experimentation, a lot of practice. And it's funny because I always tell people that the first couple, you know, rough sketches I did were so ugly that they will never see the light of day. No one's ever allowed to look at them. <laughs> so it's been like a massive learning curve. Um, but it's been so fun. Like as an artist, I've worked in so many different mediums over the years. And being able to experiment with a medium that I don't know of anyone else that works with it. So it's really this intense exploration process over the years. 
And it was just a matter of me playing around and seeing what worked, what didn't work, um, very much trial and error. And it's it's really interesting because I look at all, you know, my originals in my studio and you can see the growth from painting to painting, um, which I think is really cool too, you know, even for um, for collectors to be able to see that growth as well. Um, so I'd say from 2014 to, God, what year is it? Uh, 2023 I think yeah almost, yeah. <laughs> almost, almost 10 years which is yeah. crazy to think um wow. but I, I will say I, I started doing it um not more seriously but I started putting more time and effort into it in 2020 because of COVID I had more time um and it it is a big uh, financial investment and a big time investment because these paintings take me a very long time to complete yeah. And uh, it took you really, I remember talking to you about this earlier, but tell me a little bit about how you came upon this um, really cool realization of how to make them archival. Yes. So, oh my you know, God. you're thinking like lipstick that you could just wipe that off or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, so tell me about that journey, because I remember this was like a huge thing for you. Yes, it was. So when I first started and I made my first lipstick painting, I actually set it aside because at that time I was growing my career and I was doing a lot of custom paintings, uh, oil paintings, acrylic paintings, all that kind of stuff. And when I went back to pull it out, I realized that the colors had changed because I didn't preserve it properly. So in my mind, that was a big red flag for me. And I was like, okay, if I'm going to continue building a series with lipstick, I have to figure out a way to properly seal it. That way, you know, I have quality control. And that way, when I sell to collectors and stuff, it's preserved for years to come. So that started a very long process of more trial and error, um, working with different varnishes, different sprays, different paint on, you know, um, protective layers and things like that. And I exhausted just about everything in the art store you could think of. Um, I couldn't seem to find something that would actually dry it. It more so just sat on top of the lipstick and got kind of sticky um, because lipstick has a lot of wax in it. So you have to find something that's able to kind of penetrate through the wax. And so I was kind of like on my last leg and my mom had been doing some research at the time. She knew just how frustrated I was. And she found this gentleman that worked out in Washington, D.C., who did art restoration at one of the museums out there. She was able to find his contact information and told me, you know, just try, just reach out to him and see. So I sent him this long email and I said, listen, you know, this is what I'm doing. I'm working with lipstick. I'm trying to find a way to preserve it all these things aren't working for you since you have more of that chemistry background because you preserve art for a living. Is there something that you could recommend that I try? <laughs> oh my gosh. So literally so um, the, the Smithsonian, right? Like you're emailing <laughs> a conservationist at the Smithsonian about this. Yes. Okay, go on. And, uh, and what was the his response? The best part about his response is he was like, this is why people should stick to normal media. <laughs> like, I <that's laughs> made fun of me for it. <laughs> he was like, you know, this is why you shouldn't, you know, go outside the lines. But um, he had mentioned this aerosol varnish and he said, you know, based on all the ones that we've had experience with, chemically, this aerosol is a different composition than most of the ones you can find at the store. Um, so he sent me a link to it. I purchased it online. Um, I had never heard of it before, never seen it before. And what I was doing was I was getting these tiny little test canvases, right? So I'd put lipstick on, I'd spray a light coat, let it sit for like a couple days, spray another light coat, let it sit, you know the deal. And um, so finally I was like, okay, I'm going to touch it and see if it's sticky or not. And I go to touch it and it wasn't sticky and I could tell that it was slowly drying it. Oh my God. I remember exactly where I was. <laughs> I was in my parents' house and I started screaming at the top of my lungs. My mom probably thought there was someone in there killing people. I was like, yeah. Oh my God. I was like, it's working. It's working. And I was so happy because it had been such a long process of being able to find something that worked. Um, so now that's what I use. It's an aerosol varnish. I, I, <laughs> 
I never tell the name because I will die with that secret. <laughs> it took okay. us so long to figure out what it is. Um, and uh, so I, I will say it's out there. So if you want to go and explore, there is something that works. Um, but it's the only thing that I found that dries them. But it's interesting because it will only dry the originals to about maybe 85% dry. Um, so they're dry to the touch. But if you bump into them, it will still scrape if you apply enough pressure. So what I do with my originals is once they're complete, obviously I varnish them, a couple of light coats, and then I'll frame them with a, either a, a wood frame with museum glass or I'll do an acrylic box frame. Um, that way it has the UV protection. It has the protection of anyone, you know, accidentally bumping it. Um, but yeah, it was a process. <laughs> wow. And you know, it's so wonderful that you figured it out. So like, yay. yay. And it's so cool, you know, how your determination was really like it helped you. And no matter what, you were like, I know I've got to do this. And you know, sometimes when you get these like whispers which are become screams inside you mm -hmm. that are like, I have to do this. There's just no way out. You've got to do it. And you figured it out. So that is so <laughs> cool. So inspiring. Thank uh, you. I, yeah. And it's so great that you also frame the work. I remember how um, you were showing us on, on your Instagram stories or maybe you even made a reel about it, but you had like this giant acrylic frame delivered and it was like a whole thing getting it in and getting the painting in there and I guess that was for a big commission that you did that you just mentioned right so yes. tell us about that commission how did it come about uh what does it mean and all of that yeah so that commission it's probably been my most special painting to date. So I had done a new segment here in Houston. Um, gosh, it wasn't last October. I believe it was the October before that. And that segment actually ended up circulating through some affiliate networks throughout the U.S. And I got a phone call from this woman who lived in Las Vegas, and she was inquiring about doing a custom painting. She is a breast cancer survivor. She actually got her treatment here in Houston at MD Anderson. And at that point in time, I had not thought about doing custom work yet. I was just building my own series. And she said, you know, I really loved your Ohana painting. I was about to buy that original. But then I thought, you know, I'd rather have one big rose instead of three roses. And she said, you know, could you paint that for me? And so, you know, kind of thought about it for a little bit and I I thought, you know what, at first I didn't want to do custom work. And then I thought, you know, she's a breast cancer survivor. She's gone through the, you know, she's a part of the community that I'm here to serve. So if I can find a way to make a, a one of a kind painting for her, I'm going to do it. So I agreed to it and I said, yes, you know, let's go. So we had decided on a painting that was uh, 60 inches by 60 inches. So five feet by five feet. It was very big. <laughs> And it was one single white rose. Um, and the best part about her custom painting was, I told her, I said, listen, I have a ton of lipstick inventory and I'm more than happy to use that. But because this painting is special for you, let's grab lipstick that means something to you. Let's grab lipstick from your friends, from your family members. Let's get you know your medical team involved. So if you have doctors, nurses, surgeons that want to participate, like let's use their lipstick. So we were able to um, collect 26 different tubes from all of the women that helped her through her breast cancer journey. And they sent them all to me and um, I just got to work and I started painting and it probably took me, oh gosh, um, all in total, probably almost a year to do her painting. Um, I was working on a couple other things at that point, but it was very much a labor of love. And you're right. We ordered the custom acrylic box frame, had that come in. We had that installed on it and that completely elevated it. I thought those frames just like highlighted the work so beautifully. And then I had to ship it to her in Las Vegas, which I had never done before. So I was terrified. 
with it leaving my studio, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this is a year of my life in this painting. And now I have to let it go on this like dirty truck. I was so scared. Um, but we created- It wasn't that dirty. It. No, it wasn't that dirty. It was, you know, custom created and, and shipped out. And um, she got it and she sent me a FaceTime video um, of her with it. And it was just like the coolest- moment to know that I got to somehow be a part of her story and I got to take something that was a dark and a hard experience for her and I got to bring some beauty to it and you know I still get messages from her and uh you know we've been able to create this wonderful friendship and you know even when she's in Houston we'll go to dinner and it's been great and she'll text me and she says you know I see your painting every day when I come down the stairs and every day it puts a smile on my face and I get to see you know all of the women that that are special in my life that helped me through. Um, and then obviously, you know, from her sale, I was able to donate 20% of that sale back to the National Breast Cancer Foundation in honor of her. Uh, and it was amazing. It was just all around. It was such an incredible experience and a, a great honor for me as an artist, for sure. Well, I love that so much. What a beautiful story. Now, I want to... I, leave our listeners with some really valuable information today. And that is, I'm wondering what are three actionable steps that we can take today against breast cancer? Oh, this is a great question. Um, so the first one is the easiest one. The first one is every woman should be performing a self breast exam once a month. So in the breast cancer community, there is this campaign called Feel It on the First. So the first of the month, um, whether that's in the shower, whether that's when you're getting dressed, you should be feeling your chest under your armpits, around your breast. You should be feeling that area. Um, and I always advise women, if you shower with a loofah, throw your loofah away. There is actually a woman who I've met through social media, a very young woman. I believe she was only in her twenties when she was diagnosed. She found her lump in her breast because she accidentally dropped her loofah in the shower and she was too lazy to pick it up. So she soaked her body with her hands and that's how she found her lump. And so that is a big barrier that you don't realize is in between your hand and your own body. So you could be going over something that you don't even know is there. Um, so that's definitely the easiest thing to do. It should be a part of your monthly routine. Um, it's, you know, just as easy as putting lotion on, it takes no time at all, and it could save your life. Um, the second thing is schedule your mammogram, um, especially if you're at that age, you know, I believe like 35, 40 years old, where it's becoming more of a requirement, you should have it scheduled. Um, and don't, you know, don't just schedule it for yourself, but you should be reminding the women in, in your life, like, Hey, have you scheduled your mammogram yet? Have, are you taking care of your, of your health and your breast health? I think as women, we're so good at putting everybody before us, especially if you're, you know, a mother or a wife there's, you know, you want to take care of everybody else before you take care of yourself. And so that's a very easy way to make sure that you're putting yourself and your health first. Um, and then the third thing you could do is you could support my art. Um, you could buy an original painting. You can commission me to do a custom painting out of your own lipstick. Um, you can purchase reproductions for yourself or for a friend, um, because 20% of my proceeds goes back to the National Breast Cancer Foundation. And they are an incredible, incredible foundation um, that works really hard to help every woman in the moment, whether she's going through breast cancer, whether um, she is diagnosed as um, metastatic breast cancer and she's terminal, whether she's just a woman who wants more resources and to be educated on breast cancer who hasn't been diagnosed. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to support them and their mission. And yeah, those are the three easiest things. <laughs> And it's so important to remember yeah. that, you know, when breast cancer attacks, it doesn't just attack the person who has it. It's everyone mm -hmm. who's in that person's life and everyone yeah. around them. So really urge you and everyone around you, remind your friends, go get tested, get that mammogram. How early should we be getting the mammograms? Like what age? 
So I believe most, most insurance companies, and I know NBCF, I think they stand by 40 um, for being, you know, the requirement age. I will say personally that I have, I have seen, and I have met women who've come through my studio and told me their stories with their breast cancer experience. Um, I've met women as young as 21, 22, who've been diagnosed and gone through that. So just because you're younger, don't think that, you know, you're invincible. It, it does happen in young women. Um, and we're kind of noticing that unfortunately it's becoming younger and younger. So we don't know if that has to do with, you know, environmental factors, um, stress factors, you know, birth control factors. We're not really sure. So I would say, you know, mammogram for sure around 35 to 40 years old. Um, and then if you're younger than that, you should be doing your monthly self exams. They're free. And, uh, you know, if you catch breast cancer in its early stages, it is 99.9% survivable. That is huge. So the uh, earlier you can find it, the better. So being able to do that self-exam at home is incredible. I mean, I've met a lot of women who that's, that's saved their life. That is incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Where can we learn more about you and your work? Yes. Yeah, so um, I have an Instagram account. It's at painted with lipstick. I also have a website online. It is painted with lipstick.com. Um, you can go there and see all of the originals I have available as well as reproductions. And that's also where you can go to contact me if you're interested in doing a custom lipstick painting. Um, what else? Oh, if you'd like to send me an email, uh, it is painted with lipstick at gmail.com. And if you live in the Houston area, or if you, you know, ever come to Houston on a trip, I work at Silver Street Studios and I'm here all the time. So just come knock on my door. <laughs> and we can I love out. it. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And uh, I can't wait to see what else, where your career takes you. This is so incredible. Thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Support your community by sharing this podcast, leaving a review, and follow The Artist Advisory on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore advisory. And visit us online at www.theartistadvisory.com.